Thanks, Amy. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon um, slash almost morning slash midday. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Adam Block. I'm chair of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, for Needham. Um, this is an open meeting of the Needham Council of Economic Advisors uh, and is being uh, conducted consistent remotely with um, uh, uh, it being conducted remotely consistent with uh, current state regulations. And this is also being recorded, this re uh, webinar. Public access to this meeting does not ensure that there will be public participation unless required by law. This particular meeting uh, will not have public uh, uh, participation. Uh, although I will say that uh, this webinar, uh, which is being recorded, will be um, uh, 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 um, uh, loaded, uploaded to our website. And uh, in addition to that, all materials, including the agenda and the presentation, uh, when it's provided to us, will be posted on the town's website at needhamma.gov. Uh, again, that's needhamma.gov. Um, first, I'd like to uh, confirm that members of the Council of Economic Advisors are present. Uh, when I call your name, please respond in the affirmative. Um, there, uh, I understand that some additional members will be uh, attending as we roll in. Um, uh, for others uh, participating, including the town staff, uh, Amy, um, we'll call on you as well. Uh, uh, and for everyone else, please be aware that others may be able to see you. Anything that you say or share or, uh, or state will be a matter of public record. All, and I've mentioned all supporting materials uh, for this uh, meeting will be included uh, on the website, including the agenda and our uh, the materials. Again, the website is uh, needhamma.gov. The ground rules for this meeting are designed to allow for any accurate public uh, record. Um, I'll introduce our speakers, and then after they conclude their remarks, uh, I'll open up uh, to the council and town staff for any questions that they have. Um, I'm going to take a, a quick roll call now of our uh, membership. Um, Stu Agler. Don't see Stu. Um, uh, I don't believe Tina is with us. Tina, are you here? Not present. Uh, um, Glenn Camarano, is Glenn here? Uh, Bill Day. Lise. Here. Nice, thank you. Uh, Virginia. Here. Bob Henschel. Adam Meisner. Here. David Montgomery. Here. Uh, uh, Matt Telkoff. Uh, and uh, Mike Wilcox. Here. I may have missed Rick Putprush. Yep, I'm here. Good. Uh, good to see everybody. Glad to have the band back together, so to speak. Um, uh, we're here today. Uh, to hear a presentation, which is a course credit. This is a culmination of uh, um, an academic year's work uh, with um, uh, BC students, uh, which I'm about to introduce. Uh, this is uh, from uh, Professor Ed Chazen's uh, class, Real Estate Field Projects through the Carroll School of Management. We're grateful today to have um, uh, the following students with us to present this very interesting study. Uh, 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 and when I call your name, if you could please uh, answer in the affirmative, that would be helpful. Uh, Nick Alvarez. Good morning, everyone. Very good. Good morning. Thank you, Nick. Grayson Cohen. Affirmative. Uh, Gavin Cunningham. Here. Uh, Ryan Horning. Here as well. Anna Jacobs. Here. And Claire, uh, uh, Claire McAvoy. Here. Professor Ed Chazen. Here. In the event I missed it, I apologize. Uh, Amy Helson, our Economic Development Manager. Yes, and also um, Greg Reedman, the president of the Newton Needham Chamber of Commerce. Excellent. Greg, are you with us? 
Good, thank you. Uh, so, so these students, uh, as we're all about to, um, to see, have been uh, pursuing this study for a year of the mixed use 128 area in Needham. This is a, uh, a very early stage exploration uh, as, uh, as they're looking at various options for the district. Uh, there will be plenty of opportunities uh, um, to discuss and to solicit uh, broader community discussion uh, uh, at large if and when anything evolves from this. Again, the purpose of this study is really um, uh, uh, the pursuit of an academic uh, requirement uh, for school. And we're grateful to the chamber and to Greg, who was, uh, had been able to facilitate the introduction uh, between Professor Ed Chasen and ourselves. Uh, this is um, uh, this uh, course, I understand, uh, Professor Chasen, you've uh, conducted studies in multiple uh, municipalities, including um, Newton, Wellesley, Lowell, Cambridge, uh, Charlestown, Woburn, Boston, and Lynn, among others, perhaps. Um, and so uh, um, with that, I think that uh, I'd like to turn it over to uh, your group, Professor Chasen, and uh, let you guys take it from there. Welcome and thank you all for coming. Okay, thank you, Adam. Uh, and thank all of you for attending today. This is terrific to have uh, such support for the students. Uh, my name is Edward Chazen and I'm a professor at Boston College in the Carroll School of Management and every spring semester, so this actually has been uh, worked on since January. Um, every spring semester, I create three consulting projects for either town governments, private developers, um, or not-for-profit organizations with some involvement around real estate and economic development. So this is one of the three we did this semester. Uh, the other two we did were for private developers. One was Leggett McCall Properties for a very big project in Charlestown. And the other was for New England Development for a very big project in East Cambridge. Uh, the students have met with me every week since January. Uh, and they've gone out into the field and done a lot of primary and secondary research and came up with a plan that they believe is uh, very dispositive for uh, improving uh, this site, the mixed use 128 site. And um, it'll take about an hour to go through the presentation. And I'm gonna turn it over to the students and take it from there and thank you again. I specifically wanna thank Amy Helson for facilitating this and for Greg Reedman, who I've had the pleasure to know for a number of years now, who has um, facilitated uh, two projects now, uh, this one and one a few years back in Newton. We look forward to working with you all in the future. Hi everyone, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. We're really excited to show you the work that we have been doing this semester in our vision for mixed use site 128 in Needham, Mass. So first we will meet the team and get some introductions. Hello everyone, I'm Nick Alvarez. I'm a senior here at BC, I'm studying finance and I'm from Hillsdale, New Jersey. Hi everyone, I'm Grayson Cohen. I'm also a senior at Boston College studying political science and I'm from Falmouth, Maine. Hi, I'm Gavin Cunningham. I'm a senior here at Boston College studying finance and I'm from Sudbury, Massachusetts. Hi everyone, Ryan Horning. I'm also a finance major. That's a senior at Boston College from Pewaukee, Wisconsin. I'm Hannah Jacobs. I'm a senior at Boston College studying finance and operations management and I'm from Holton, Maine. Hi, I'm Claire McAvoy. Um, I'm also a senior at Boston College. I'm studying finance and accounting, and I'm originally from Little Silver, New Jersey. As for our agenda, we will first present to you an overview of the site along with first impressions. Then we will discuss our client and methodology, demographics of Needham, nearby influential properties. We will examine some interviews, case studies, our development proposal, and then we will show you our ideas for site branding, uh, potential designs and tenants, architectural renderings, property tax analysis, challenges and opportunities. And finally, we will conclude. 
So here's our site, mixed use site 128. It's about 27 acres located between Route 128, Highland Avenue and the Charles River. Our site is located in Northern Needham and borders Newton um, across from the Charles River. So as you can see from this aerial view, the site contains a lot of unique uh, businesses that serve a very niche market, primarily mechanic and repair. And on our first trip to the site, we immediately recognized several outstanding opportunities. As we near the back of the property where you can see the Charles River, we realized this resource was incredibly underutilized. We then saw this great Route 128 visibility, which you can see in the bottom picture. Um, and this signaled to us really good characteristics for office buildings. Additionally, the proximity to Route 128 allows the quick ability to get on and off of the interstate. However, we also ident identified some key challenges. The buildings are quite disjointed with no real cohesion to one another. And because of this, the flow of roads is not natural. They twist around and there are hidden back roads throughout the layout. This characteristic along with elevation and grade changes throughout the site could present um, issues during construction. To give you some more context to the framework of our research, I'll go through our client and methodology. So our client is the town of Needham where we've been working with Amy Hilson, the economic development manager who asked us to do this research and redevelopment plan for the town of Needham as they're being incredibly forward thinking about underutilized space in their town. So we engaged in extensive market research, including demographic analysis and developer and broker research. We then visited the site to better understand the layout and the Needham environment. We conducted interviews with developers, brokers, professionals in key industries and other fundamental stakeholders that gave us key insights to the industry and greatly aided our redevelopment plan. And then as for the massing plan, we actually arranged the buildings on the site and worked with an architect for renderings of the site, as well as identified a tenant mix. We also engaged in feasibility analysis that included property tax analysis, sources of our funding and economic and social benefits. So now we'll look at the demographics of Needham. Needham has approximately 31,000 residents in about 12.3 uh, square miles. Needham has a very specific wealthy demographic. The median household income is much greater than the US medium household income. The poverty rate is much lower than the US poverty rate. And the unemployment rate is about 1% lower than the US average. It's important to note that this is also not a very diverse population, about 85.3% white and 76% um, have achieved a bachelor's degree. This suggests a very educated population and a certain target customer for our site. If we look at the age breakdown, starting from the top, about a third of the population is school aged. So we're going to need to be conscious of overcrowding of schools due to family oriented housing options. Uh, the largest age bracket is the working age individuals. So we're going to need to examine employment opportunities in surrounding areas, median household income, as well as commute options. And then for the 65 plus age bracket, we need to consider um, what senior housing is currently available to them. There is a very large percentage of the population in the 50 to 64 year old age range. And these would be the seniors, adult children who would be instrumental in transitioning them to senior housing. Um, additionally, those 60 to 65 would be transitioning, transitioning to senior housing soon. So there is an increasing elderly population. So now we'll look at some nearby influential properties. We selected these sites because their development will have an impact on ours, whether via traffic or demand. And they also can give us ideas on how we can use our site complementary to how they are being built. First, we have the Wesley Office Park. The site is very similar to ours, as you can see in the pictures on the right. Um, it is also close to some key roadways, in this case, Route 95 and Route 9, as well as in close proximity to the Charles River, which is an incredible natural resource. They are also a um, mixed use property. They are looking at including housing, including affordable housing and retail along with other amenities. A threat that we share is traffic concerns will be important to see how they approach the problem when examining our own traffic mitigation plan. 
The Boston Children's Hospital is looking to build a pediatric ambulatory surgical facility located at 381st Avenue in Needham, and they're currently in the planning and regulatory stages. But as you can see, this site will be located very close to our own, and its proximity will influence the demographic and purpose of people in the area. So we are considering um, medical offices and other amenities that would pair well with healthcare and wellness. Now we have the Riverside development. Um, it is also mixed use. It is going to include housing units, including affordable housing, upgrades to the trail network, and upgrades for city and neighborhood improvements. There's also 400,000 square feet dedicated to life sciences. Um, this property is located between Route 95, Route 9, and the Riverside T-Stop. So they do share the advantage of being close to key roadways but an amenity, amenity that we do not have the luxury of is public transit um, and they're located close to the river tie, Riverside T-Stop. Um, something really important is that they are allocating 400,000 square feet to life sciences. And this really highlights that the life science industry is taking off in a huge way. And this trend is going to be discussed further in later slides. Wingate Senior Housing is a continuing care retirement community located about a half mile from the site across the highway next to the Muzzy Ford site. Um, a continued care retirement community includes all kinds of senior housing on one property. So it would be a mix of independent and assisted living along with memory care. Um, CCRCs require a high entrance fee so that residents can progress to more intensive housing units on the same property and the rent will be flat. And this is very popular in areas with wealth the aging demographics, um, which we do find in Needham. We've also listed the number of units in each housing segment, which would be important numbers to keep in mind going forward. Overall, Wingate Senior Housing showcases how this area is receptive to senior housing communities. And finally, we will look at the Northland Newton development. This is very close to our site, one mile away. As you can see, I've highlighted uh, Northland in red. Our site is highlighted in black on the bottom map. Um, this Northland development will include um, 800 housing units, office space, and retail space, so it is also mixed use. A threat that we share with Northland and that is exacerbated by its development is traffic. Highland Avenue already sees much congestion. An additional uh, residential space will further contribute to this problem, but something else really important to note is on the bottom, bottom map, you can see a greenway. And this is a walking trail that runs along the Northland site and ends across the river from our site. We're focusing on activating the Charles River and this presents a unique opportunity. We would like to connect the trail via a pre-existing defunct railroad bridge. And this would activate the Charles River as well as bring foot traffic um, from residents at the Northland site and reduce the need for parking. So some of our key takeaways, there are many mixed use projects in recent development that are relevant to our focus. The Boston's Children's Hospital facility leads us to believe medical office would be great on our site. There's a huge life science boom. We have great demographics for senior housing. We're also looking at multifamily housing. We need to be careful about our, um, our target market as multifamily housing could put pressure on schools, but also the community is receptive to senior communities. Um, we are close to some key roadways, uh, but there's also already this pressure on the infrastructure um, in terms of transportation and traffic concerns. And we are very close to the Charles River, which is something uh, we're very excited to take advantage of. And now Nick will discuss some of our interviews. Thank you so much, Hannah. Over the past couple of months, we've had a multitude of interviews with uh, a vast number of, of people ranging from different companies to different organizations. Um, to be able to talk about them today, we've actually split them up into three buckets or subsections. The first one I will be talking about are the interviews with developers. Um, as you can see, these are a couple of the developers we spoke with. Um, and these interviews over phone call and Zoom were very enlightening. Um, we learned um, many things, but some of the important topics that we want to cover um, is the market reports that we went over with the developers. Um, as we've been saying, life science is very hot right now, and there is potential for life science on this site. Furthermore, um, 
how to incorporate green space within uh, mixed use 128, livening up the environment. Um, also, as we've mentioned, there is this potential for senior housing and specifically that 70 plus residence target. How would we make sure to um, take care of the needs that those types of people need? We also spoke about recommendations for parking, um, where we should put it on our site and how we can maximize the flow with the roads that are currently there. The second subsect of interviews we conducted are with brokers. Um, with these, uh, with these, during these interviews, um, they gave us great information on market research and specifically property comparables, something that Ryan will talk about later in the presentation. Um, these brokers gave us information about suburban life, whether it be within Needham or with the, within the uh, surrounding area. We spoke about different asset classes, such as senior housing, life science, two that we've already mentioned, but also experiential retail and office space. Two things that we, two asset classes we hadn't um, come up with that wasn't in our minds, but with these interviews um, were brought into consideration for this uh, mixed use 128 project. The third bucket of interviews we conducted were with neighborhood and community groups. These were also super influential and I'm very glad we conducted these. Um, we delved deeper into issues with green spaces. Where should we put them on our site? How can we make the best use of them? Um, we also tie this in with environmental factors. The, the one thing I love so much about the Boston area and specifically Needham is how progressive they are with um, environmental science and, and making sure that their buildings are conscious of these efforts. Um, on top of this, we also spoke about the traffic concerns. Highland Avenue, as many of you know, is already so congested that nine to five traffic is absolutely brutal. Um, we spoke with um, Monica Tibbetts, not the executive director of the 128 Business Council about these traffic concerns and how we can mitigate um, them to create the best flow of, of cars within our um, area. In um, overall, the takeaways we got from these interviews are the five bullet points we have here. Number one, it's that life science, office space, and senior housing are all favorable uses within our site. Um, as we said, and you will hear mentioned many times, life science is very hot along with medical office space. And we think that this is the main use that we want for mixed use 128. Number two, we wanna activate the Charles River as much as possible. Um, the one thing we heard along with green space is this natural resource that our site has that many don't. Taking this to uh, the advantage of the property is something that we wanna put on the forefront and that we, you will see um, in the development of mixed use 128. The third bullet point was community space would be re well received. Um, a lot of this development will have to do with uh, private buildings such as the office spaces, the residential, um, sorry, the experimental retail and the residential communities. But we also would like to add something more on the public side, something as a performing arts uh, center. Number four, something that I've already mentioned is light retail has been recommended. Um, originally, we weren't sure if this was the best use of the property because there's already light retail all along um, the Needham and Newton area. But as I mentioned, brokers thought this would be a great idea, something that would liven up this area, make it not just the nine to five uh, workspace, but also some, uh, an area that people would come to on the weekend. And lastly, we need to be conscious of traffic. As I've mentioned, Highland Avenue is, uh, is brutal, um, specifically during those work hours. We wanna make sure to mitigate that as well as possible. Moving on, um, Ryan will talk about the case studies um, and the particular properties that we think are very similar to ours. Awesome. Thank you, Nick. So yes, before we decided on our plan and our proposed uses, we wanted to look at some successful developments in Massachusetts um, that fit three criteria that were similar to our site. So we were looking for comparable properties that had close proximity to Route 128 and specifically had highway visibility to see how they um, took advantage of that. Uh, second, we looked for sites that successfully rebranded and had a rebranding strategy to be able to activate the site in a um, better use. And then lastly, we looked for sites that had previous light industrial and were suburban and potentially some poor site planning uh, to help us understand the transition of how they were able to change that site to the new use. So we found three, three different case studies that we uh, felt were appropriate 
Two of them were in Burlington, Massachusetts, and one is in Western Massachusetts, which we felt had somewhat similar demographics to Needham and were appropriate to study. So the first case study we looked at was the district, which is in Burlington, Massachusetts. Outlined in red in the bottom left uh, image, you can see the site and Route 128 is at the top of the image there um, with the cars. And so this site was formerly the New England Executive Park um, and was transformed by national development in 2017. It includes 1.3 million square feet of space with mixed uses, including office, hotel, restaurants. And one thing that we really admired about this site is the walkable open space and how they're able to transform all of these uses um, and connect them through nature trails, pedestrian paths, and even pocket parks, uh, which were considered <coughs> for our proposal. Um, as you can see in the bottom right, these are some of the trails and some of the artwork is what we also admired about, which I will um, talk a little bit more about in our site branding. And then same with the open uh, entrance, inviting entrance way up there on uh, the top right, just showing the rebranding and the uh, open from the major roadways. So another thing that we admired about this space is that uh, it took into account life beyond nine to five. And so looking at their tenant mix, um, some of the big tenants that we found were Island Creek Oyster, Oyster Bar, Tuscan Kitchen, and a few other restaurants that um, have been very successful in the space. So next, our second case study was Third Avenue and Northwest Office Park, which are two different um, developments done by Nordbloom. Uh, this was a formerly an industrial area. And as you can see in the bottom left, um, is adjacent to Route 128 and also Route 3. Um, what we noticed about this site is that it's very pedestrian friendly and has con a su successful connection between the two different um, adjacent developments. And what we admired about the um, uses as well is that they're able to mix a tech office park with lifestyle retail um, to transform this community. And just these two pictures on the right are examples of some of the office uh, buildings and tenants that are out in this site. Um, and the Northwest Park Keurig actually has their headquarters there as well. And then lastly for University Station, um, this was completed in 2015 by New England Development and includes 2 million square feet of space. Um, the one thing about this property is it is 120 acres, so it is much larger than our site. So some of their uses, including their retail tenants, are much larger um, than tenants that we could bring onto our site, uh, including Wegmans and Target. And then some of the other uses that we uh, found interesting on this site were office, uh, residential, which includes some senior housing, and then also hotel. And then for their uh, medical office tenant, we saw Brigham and Women's uh, Healthcare was the anchor. So we took that into account when we were considering our tenants. Um, as you can see from the picture on the bottom left, uh, it's in close proximity to Route 128. And the one thing that we noticed about this site that our site lacks, as Hannah mentioned earlier, is that it has direct access to public transportation with that T-stop in the bottom right uh, portion of the site. And when branding this site, they branded it around this T-stop, and which is why it was called University Station, um, which was instrumental in the uh, rebranding. So now some key takeaways. So what we, did, what we found about these sites is that rebranding was essential to activating the space again. So um, with University Station, for example, it was similar to our site in that it had 30 to 50 um, individual parcels of light industrial that were uh, owned by different owners. And they were able to combine all of this, like all of these parcels into one succinct site. Um, and so we found that this rebranding strategy of naming it after the T-stop uh, made it more cohesive and more inviting to um, community members. And then with the close proximity to Route 128, we saw office as an important uh, asset class with high visibility on 128 that uh, tenants could take advantage of. So we wanted to position our office buildings uh, in close proximity to the highway for that visibility. And then for complementary mixed uses, we saw office, senior housing, light retail, um, and restaurant and other spaces as uh, complementary uses that would be successful on our site. And then lastly, what we noticed was different about our site that we wanted to take advantage of is that we had the Charles River. Um, so as you will see, that is a strong um, proponent of our proposal. So now I will pass it off to Grayson and Gavin and talk about our development proposal. Thanks, Ryan. So in order for us to propose a successful development, we need to take into account everything that we've talked about before. We need to talk about the um, interviews that we've done, the case studies, and the local influential properties. 
So in doing so, we were able to come up with a what we believe to be a very strong um, development proposal, and we can take a deeper dive into that on the next slide. So I'm gonna give you guys a couple of seconds just to look over this before I uh, get into the numbers. Okay, so as far as the mix of uses that we're looking for on this site, like we've been talking about for the majority of this presentation, we are uh, very strong on life sciences and medical office. So this area has been booming all across Boston. And it's been moving into the suburbs. We're gonna talk about that a little later. So additionally, we're looking to put in senior housing and multifamily housing. Um, we're again gonna talk about that later, but the multifamily housing is going to be mostly geared toward younger couples so we're not overcrowding the schools. We're also putting in a grocer on the first floor there. We're looking to put in a performing arts center. And then as well, we're looking to put in some restaurants, a brewery and a ghost kitchen slash fast casual. Uh, in addition to that, we are looking to relocate some of the existing tenants into our commercial district or the Staples district as we're calling it. Um, so we're putting about uh, 100,000 square feet of that space in. So our life science and medical office space is gonna be roughly 175,000 square feet with the life science building being four stories and the medical office being three stories. Um, our multifamily with grocers is gonna be five stories, like I said earlier with the first floor being grocer and some other uses as well. Um, we're also gonna have a lot of parking on the site over a thousand spots. Uh, Grayson's gonna get into that a little bit later, but we believe this to be a uh, very good amount of parking for the uses that we're proposing. Um, and then if we take a look at the FAR floor area ratio, we can see that the majority of the buildings are far below one, meaning that we're gonna have a lot of open space on this site. So one more thing to consider is that gray bar at the bottom, um, open space and roads. So we're setting aside 13 acres of land for um, roads, for other, um, other urban planning stuff. And then we're also putting aside a bunch of space for like we were talking about earlier, pocket parks and green space. So we think this is gonna be an awesome addition to the area as it's gonna create an outdoor space for the community to come and gather. So in all, we're proposing uh, 384,500 square feet of development. And now I'm gonna pass it off to Grayson to kind of give you a better visual of what that's gonna look like. Thank you, Gavin. So before I get into talking about the site plan, I'm just gonna pause for a moment, let everybody take a look at this and sort of digest uh, everything that's going on here for a second or two. All right, so sort of now you'll be able to take a look at the whole site. You can see there's a lot going on here in a lot of different varied buildings, building sizes and shapes as well. So starting on the far left side, you can see we have buildings B1 and B5. So these are both the office component and lab component of our site with our life science building and our medical office building. Um, we put these buildings near the highway for really two main reasons. Firstly, it provides excellent visibility for respective tenants. Um, the TripAdvisor building is located uh, about half a mile to a mile down the highway from here. And it's incredibly visible from the road. We hope that you know other other tenants and prospective tenants could look at this and be like and understand the value of being located in such a location. It's also really close to Route 128 and Highland Avenue, which allows easy entrance and egress from the site. Additionally, as Hannah talked about earlier, there's a lot of different elevations in the site and different changes. And so we actually are hoping to take advantage of this specifically with Building One. So Building One, which is B1, is built into the side of the hill. And what this does is it actually allows us to hide two floors of underground parking in the hill by basically, because it's built at an angle, it allows us to have this parking there without needing to physically dig down like you would in other buildings, which then lets us do sort of a cheaper parking structure than needing to do underground parking, which helps save money and help us hide our parking, which can oftentimes be an eyesore for most buildings. Moving on, we have building B5, which is a medical office building, which is our hope. And it's really close to B1, really because we hope to have this be a sort of office district in the site. Additionally, if we were to attract a larger life science tenant in the future that maybe wanted more space, it would allow us to make both of these buildings devoted toward one tenant to allow easy synergies between buildings so that um, employees could easily move between one building and the other. Moving along, we have our parking garage, which is in between a life science building and a senior housing building. This is a structured parking garage. And you know, while we would love to not have structured parking on site, the reality is we need spaces to accommodate these buildings. And so this is gonna be roughly a 600 space garage that will service our office buildings and our senior housing building, as well as any other parking on site that's necessary. Continuing on, we have our senior housing building. So this building is gonna be devoted mostly toward assisted living and not independent living. 
We put this up in the corner of the site for a couple of for a couple of reasons, but firstly, it helps create a really nice sort of isolated building in the sense that it's its own sort of space. It's very peaceful and quiet and it has green space all around it and great views of the river. This allows residents to easily be able to get onto the walking trail, as you can see, to head towards, you know, maybe they want to walk with their family up to the Northland site to grab lunch, or they just want to walk along the trail and just get outside during the day. It's really a great place to be. Moving on, we have buildings B6, B7, B8, and B9. These are sort of our um, community type uses throughout the site. B6 is a community theater, theater space, which we are really excited about on site. It's as Hannah talked about, and we'll talk about a little bit later. It's a really great place for the community to come together to have events. And it's also great to have near senior housing as you know, maybe these residents have grandchildren that are performing. They can easily walk there or on a Saturday night, it's just a great place to go. Um, B7, B8, and B9 are all restaurants and a ghost kitchen, which Gavin will expand upon later, and a brewery. And this is really a great place for people of really who live in Needham or who live and work in the buildings nearby. Maybe after work, they want to go grab a drink. We'll talk about this a bit more later, but it's a really great community space we're really excited about. Continuing on, we have building B3 and this large parking lot as well. This parking lot services all those commercial spaces I just mentioned, as well as this uh, apartment building with the grocer on the ground floor and a cafe and gym. Uh, this building is going to be like um, was mentioned earlier, mostly geared toward uh, one and two bedroom residences, but it's going to be bent for people of all ages. That means that anybody from you know the age 20, let's say, who wants to live on their own, or maybe an, even somebody in their 80s can live here and have a, and have a residence that will be geared toward them. We'll have 80 units as well, so it's a very livable space. Finally, in our northern part of the site here, we have what's called the Staple District, which I will expand upon later. But the idea and hope of this is where we can relocate um, existing tenants on site here into more efficient and newer space with better visibility, which will enable them to like have much better access than before and visibility so that they can continue to service the community as they have for years and years. I'm now going to pass it back over to Gavin. Awesome. Thank you, Grayson. So one of the things that I'm sure you guys have heard over and over for us today uh, is the importance of life science on this site. Um, so the life science market, again, has been booming throughout Boston. And as you can see in the uh, bottom left and bottom right uh, images, so the farthest right star is Cambridge, which is uh, the life science capital of the world. Um, and then Watertown and Lexington have also been growing life science hubs outside of the city. Um, and then Needham is that bottom left star. So there is life science expanding into the suburbs. And uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more in the next slide as well. But the uh, market conditions surrounding the industry show very promising signs for further expansion. So some of the opportunities that we're seeing within the life science field is that this could help us mitigate traffic because lab hours aren't necessarily the typical nine to five. People could be coming in early, staying later, and uh, working depending on what their project uh, needs. The other opportunity is uh, more and more life science developing in the area. So again, I'll talk about that next slide, but Needham and Newton have been seeing significant life science upticks in the past couple of years. So some of the challenges to building life science and putting it on site is that it's very expensive to build. So a developer or someone coming in to develop the space is gonna have to spend a lot of money. If that space is sitting vacant, um, they could be in trouble financially. So another challenge that we are seeing is how to attract the talent away from the city and Cambridge towards the suburbs. So that's something we would want to continue looking into and look at some of the ways that uh, Watertown and Lexington have done it. But there are um, there's a huge amount of demand overflowing from the cities into the suburbs. So on the next slide here, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the life science market conditions. So right now in Cambridge and the greater Boston area, there is a very limited supply of life science space. There's only about a 1.5% vacancy rate within the city, meaning that there's not a lot of space for expansion and there's not a lot of um, growth opportunities for these firms in the city unless there's significant development done. That being said, there is development by firms like Alexandria going on, but that's again, years down the line and with the growth rates that we're seeing, it's going to be hard for them to satisfy the need within the city. There's also 45,000 square feet at 100% occupancy on 53 and 115 4th Street. Riverside Development is putting in a lot of life science as well, and as is 275 Grove Street in Newton. So Watertown and Newton, like I was talking about earlier, 
have seen significant upticks in development. So there's over 2 million square feet of development or pipeline going on in Watertown and Newton alone. So with all of that going on, we wanted to take a look at some of the potential tenants for this site, looking at either the lab space or the lab space and medical office. So according to Newmark and CBRE, um, their reports are showing that Moderna, Bluebird Bio, CRISPR Therapeutics, and Afina are the fastest growing firms in Boston that will likely be looking for new space in the near future. So these firms are cutting edge firms that are brand new. I'm sure everybody here has heard of Moderna now with the COVID vaccine, but um, these firms would be excellent uh, potential tenants for the site. So I'm now gonna pass it back to Grayson to kind of go over some of the architectural stuff that we're looking for for these life science buildings. Yeah, so these renderings here show what we hope to replicate in our site. Um, all three of these pictures are from Cambridge and they're very sleek, modern buildings that are really geared toward young professionals in the life sciences world. And it's really a place that they want to work in. Um, they're really cool, like modern, sleek buildings. It's a place where you go to work and you just feel, almost feel innovative. There's outdoor space to sit, to enjoy lots of natural light. And we hope to build buildings that might not be as modern as these ones, but still have a nice modern touch that allow for these really innovative companies to have an innovative space where they can work in and continue to attract and retain um, talent. This right here is a stacking plan for B1. I'm sure it was slightly confusing when I talked about it in the site plan. And this just illustrates how you can see the site grade um, sort of along the side here in green and how the building would fit in with that and how you could have this underground parking without actually needing to really dig down into the site. Um, and this sort of shows the anatomy of the building and how everything would fit in. Great, so um, now I'm gonna talk about a, another building that we believe would be a great use for this site, which is a senior housing facility. Um, as it was previously mentioned, our proposition would be a continuing care retirement community or a CCRC, which would include services for independent living, assisted living and memory care all under the same roof. Within this community, we are planning to have 90 units available um, additionally, the site will utilize this idea of aging in place as seniors in the community can access different facilities as they age if necessary. Um, the demographics of Needham are very desirable for a senior housing community, which is something that we heard over and over from um, the interviews that we conducted with different experts um, in the field. Two demographics that are really important to look at with a potential senior housing facility are the target resident population, but also the adult child population. Um, one of the trends that we saw is a growing population in both of these segments. And this will also create an ample pipeline for years to come down the line. Additionally, this adult child population is often the demographic that influences where their parents will live. So paired with this trend of out migration from major cities means that the need of market will be seeing high demand for senior housing facilities in the future. Um, if you go on to the next slide, we can look at some inspiration for what we were thinking for these facilities to look like. Um, some important things to note here is the wraparound in the front of the building on the left side. Um, this would really allow for easy drop off and pick up access to those living in the building. We're also planning to have this building um, be four stories and at the top left corner of our site plan. This is a really strategic placement of this building as it's gonna back up to the Charles River um, and the walking path so that seniors um, and their visitors will be able to utilize the space really easily. Um, the senior housing facility will be on its own space in the site, but it's not gonna be isolated from the other uses such as the grocery store and the medical offices as those who are in the senior housing facility will be able to really step out of their building and have the entire site to utilize. Moving on to building B3, uh, this is our mixed resident apartment building with a grocer on the first floor. Uh, we are planning to have this be a five story building with 80 units of apartments. We're also planning on including a small footprint grocery store such as Brothers Marketplace or Trader Joe's um, along with a low equipment requirement um, fitness center such as like an Orange Theory or a Pure Bar um, and also a small cafe, which would either be within the grocer or as a standalone facility. We decided on this setup for the building for a few reasons. Um, to start with the apartments, 
Uh, I think Gavin mentioned this earlier, but they're all going to be one to two bedrooms. Um, this was decided so that young families can really be prioritized um, and the exposure to schools in the Needham area can be limited. As we heard from various community stakeholders that this was an important consideration. So for that reason, uh, this building will have no three bedroom apartments. Um, we also spoke with community stakeholders who mentioned the need for age friendly housing. So we're planning to allocate a percentage of these apartments somewhere around 20% to be age friendly. Um, the apartment building as a whole will also include adequate elevators, a bathroom in the lobby, and will follow universal design guidelines, including wide doorways to accommodate walker use and uh, lower counter heights to accommodate those who are using wheelchair, wheelchairs or other devices. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, I can talk more about the other uses within this building. So moving on to the grocery store on the first floor, we figured this would be a great use as, use as it can be utilized by all residents on the site. Um, based on the kind of, of small footprint grocery we want to have as a resident, the working population on the site would also be able to take advantage of any grab and go options. Um, moving on to the fitness center, given the popularity of these in recent years, this would also be able to be utilized by a wide range of the population on the site. Um, also by having it be a low equipment fitness center, a lot of different fitness companies um, would be possible as uh, various tenants. Um, and it's much less permanent than a full equipment gym. We also believe that by having it uh, be this type of fitness center rather than a resident only gym within the building, more members of the community would be able to utilize the space. Um, and lastly, this slide shows um, the stacking of our building, a more specific view of what we were thinking for each floor. Hopefully this allows you all to visualize um, the idea for the building that I was previously describing. Um, okay, so then the next building I wanna to touch on is the medical office building that we are envisioning for the site. Uh, this will be a three-story medical office building in the lower uh, right-hand corner of our site plan. So this spot has great visibility to the highway. Um, so putting a medical office space here will allow it to command higher rents. Uh, as I mentioned previously, a medical office building will also pair well with other uses on the site. There are also um, a few trends within this area that really encouraged us to pursue the use of a medical office building. Um, for example, we noticed that there's a natural shift of companies moving towards the suburbs where there is more demand and also the age demographic is increasing. There's also a trend to decentralize the treatment of healthcare so that doctors who live in the suburbs don't have to commute as far into the cities to get to work. So having medical offices on our site would cater to that need. Lastly, um, as we mentioned earlier in the presentation, uh, the Beth Israel Leahy Medical Center is really close by um, along with the Boston Children's Hospital. So having medical offices here would be great as they can leverage off the proximity to these other um, sites close by. So here's the inspiration we were thinking for the building, but just to note, um, it would actually be a little bit smaller with only three stories and a lower square footage. Um, but now I'm gonna pass it off to Gavin, who's gonna talk about some of the other uses we planned for our site. Awesome, thank you. So like we've been talking about throughout the presentation, we really want this to be a site that is alive after people go home from work and uh, in the evenings and on weekends. So the life after nine to five is a key component here. And one of the ways that we are looking to add that to our site is through restaurants. So there's gonna be a huge amount of demand for restaurant space on this site. Uh, we already have the medical office and the lab building. We have the senior housing, we have the apartment buildings. Um, and then even nearby, we have the Northland development. We have thousands of units of apartments within a small radius of the site. We also have a lot of local offices from the uh, TripAdvisor space, Shark Ninja, et cetera. So there is a massive amount of demand within the area to have uh, dining on site. So we are looking to locate this like we showed earlier in kind of that um, community use space. Um, there's actually currently a restaurant Spiga in the, in the what we're calling now the commercial district that we are potentially looking to relocate into that area. So uh, in addition to that, some of the potential tenants that we're looking at are places like Branch Line, Bodega, 
oak barrel. So these are some these are some uh, pretty broad uh, spectrum of restaurants. And if we go to the next slide, we can kind of get a perspective of what these might look like on site. So this is actually the branch line uh, here, and it's like a nice big open restaurant. Um, there's space for everybody to eat. And then if we go down to the next slide, we can kind of see some of the indoor outdoor flex space. So this could be a restaurant with a three season room where you can open it up during the uh, summer and fall uh, and late spring and close it off for the winter so you can have outdoor dining, um, allow people to really enjoy the open space that we're putting on site. Um, and then kind of piggybacking off of that, one of the other uses that we're looking for the site is actually in building eight. Um, so in building eight, we are looking to put in a brewery. So the craft beer market is expected to continue to grow at a really fast pace in the New England area. Um, as I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with, there has been countless pop-up breweries coming in the Boston area. We have places like Cisco, Harpoon, Trillium, um, among several others. So this is really a market that we see growing, continuing, uh, continuing to grow. And uh, actually in the Needham area, there was a brewery that has approached people to come try to move into a site. Um, so the site is currently zoned for industrial and mixed use. So this would actually fit the current site usage. Um, so the space that we're looking to put in is actually a 9,000 square foot uh, building with indoor and outdoor dining with riverside views. This is really gonna create an awesome ambiance that can be used both in the winter and in the summer. Um, we really want people to be outdoors, enjoying the weather, having a nice beverage. This could be a great um, pairing with the office space. If somebody wants to come out after, um, after the day's over on a Friday, grab a beverage and sit by the river with some friends. Um, so if we scroll down to the next slide, um, you can see kind of some of the inspirations for the buildings. So um, in the bottom two images, you can kind of see some of the outdoor space. Um, in the top two, you get a better understanding of what a building might look like with the brewery inside of it. So we think this could be an awesome opportunity on the site. So now we're gonna look at uh, one of the really cool ideas that we came up with. It's actually called a ghost kitchen. So for anybody that's not familiar, um, a ghost kitchen is essentially a restaurant, but without any dining capabilities. So there's no wait staff, there's no hostess, there's no servers. The entirety of the ghost kitchen is dedicated solely to food prepa uh, prep. So the ghost kitchen would prepare food and then either have it uh, picked up by an Uber Eats or a DoorDash, or uh, like we're proposing, putting in a window to have people on site be able to pick it up and get their meal on the green space on the site. So some of the opportunities that we're seeing with ghost kitchens is that there's a 300% increase in market demand since 2014. And since there is a proximity to so many large companies, um, there's a huge amount of people that could be using these ghost kitchens. So for example, TripAdvisor um, has a chef come in and cook for their employees, um, but this could be substituted with a ghost kitchen, which for them would be a cheaper option and offer a wider variety of food. So there's a huge amount of current investments in ghost kitchens um, from Google, DoorDash, Uber. There's tens and hundreds of millions of dollars flowing into it. So some of the current users of ghost kitchens, it's everything from your McDonald's and Chick-fil-A to um, more high-end celebrity uh, ghost kitchens like Guy Fieri and Mar Mariah Carey. Again, there's a low cost to enter, which makes it open to a lot of different types of cuisine and areas. So per US Foods, it's about $5,000 to enter the market. Um, and the market projection, for the globe is a trillion dollars by 2030 for ghost kitchens, which is a massive projection. So uh, this could be something awesome to get into while it's still growing rapidly. One of the cool things that we got to do is interview uh, Nicholas Makaris, who is the CEO of Boston Ghost Kitchens. And so he was able to provide us with a bunch of details on size, um, operation, et cetera, on ghost kitchens. And so with his advice, we, uh, we decided this would be an awesome use to kind of pair with the brewery. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide, but some of the challenges before we move on are traffic congestion. So a ghost kitchen would require drivers coming in and out of the site. So Highland Ave, we need to work on the traffic there and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, with the growth projections, is COVID the main driver for these projections? Um, how is this market going to continue to grow after COVID? Um, and then the cohesion of the property. So with the cohesion of the property, uh, we're gonna go down to the next slide and take a look at what the takeout window might look like for the uh, ghost kitchen. So you can see here, there's the uh, highlighted walk-up order window. So somebody could order food on their phone through the ghost kitchen. Uh, 
the ghost kitchen would then place the, or have somebody with the food orders. You just go up with your phone and grab your order. Um, so one of the things that we talked about with uh, Nick Makris is how well the ghost kitchen and food truck um, model works with a brewery. So there is a brewery that uh, Nick was at in Ohio and they had a absolutely packed um, space every single day of the week from 5 p.m. until closing. And he said that he believed the reason for this was while the brewery was serving food, they rented out space to food trucks to go around the brewery in order to service the clients who weren't necessarily at a brewery to go get food. So what we were planning here is the ghost kitchen right next to the brewery in order that the people that are at the brewery can have their beverages. And then once they get hungry, they can order food on the app and go get their food and eat outside. So this could be an awesome pairing of uses there. So now I'm gonna pass it off so we can talk a little bit more about the Performing Arts Center on site. Thank you, Gavin. So as I mentioned before, a public community space would be well received on our site and specifically in Needham. And the uh, community space that we have targeted is a Performing Arts Center. Um, with talking um, with the specific neighborhood groups um, during the interviews, one thing that we realized is there is a desperate need uh, for a theater space within the, the town of Needham. Um, currently, there are approximately 12 to 12 plus performing arts um, groups within this area. Um, and there's not a lot of space for them to practice and for them to put on their performances. Um, currently, they're practicing out of, um, we've been told out of um, high school and middle school gymnasiums, um, th those sorts of venues, places that aren't necessarily meant for performing arts uh, spaces. Um, for this reason, we think that putting this uh, Performing Arts Center on our site would be a great use to give back to the public, so to say. Um, this space would be very small. Um, the smaller the space, the more ideal it is. We don't need a big chamber hall. This isn't what um, these performing, um, performing groups need. Um, but as you could see on our development um, map, so to say, this, this uh, theater space would be in the middle of our site next to the green sp space, a place for the public to be able to use and enjoy. Um, and the reason for wanting this performing arts center is uh, one of the things that we found out and was very uh, crushing to us was without these sort of assets, um, there's a continuation of loss of art and um, tradition within this community um, in the Needham area. And for this reason, we think this performing arts center would be a, a great addition to the mixed use 128 site. Moving to the next slide. These are a few of the um, building renderings or ideas that we could uh, possibly see on the site. As you can tell, it's a modern version of an old brick building. We think this would break up the, um, the look from the medical office and the life science pretty well and it would create a cohesion within mixed use 128 that we really enjoy. Next slide. Um, one of the other benefits of having so much green space is this um, availability of outdoor flex space. Um, specifically that goes along with the restaurants and the brewery as Gavin spoke about. Um, our plan or our idea for this uh, flex space is that people would grab their food, grab their drinks, during the summer, they'd be able to go outside and enjoy the beautiful weather that um, we can have here in Boston. If you look down at the picture on the right, bottom right of the slide, you can see people outside in chairs, enjoying the warm weather. Uh, this creates an environment on the site that we really wanna see um, happen. Uh, um, furthermore, during the winter months, um, we can actually place these igloo type bubbles that you can light up, creating a, a great environment, something that would um, pique the interest and the curiosity of uh, the residents of Needham and that could um, bring people to the site. These bubbles were actually created because of um, COVID so that people could uh, dine in in restaurants without having to deal with the brutally cold weather. Um, but I think that this is a great idea for the future and something that could um, add something special to mixed use 128. Furthermore, um, on top of this performing arts center, we think that it'd be a great idea to create an amphitheater uh, for community groups to perform outside in the warm weather when it is possible. Going on to the next slide, here's a rendering of what we think that um, a you could potentially see on this site one day in the near future. 
in the back, you can see um, somewhat of the medical life science office and then uh, an interesting rendering of what we would see the performing arts center looking like. Um, this just gives you an idea of creating this environment that isn't just the nine to five workspace, bringing people to our site, having an amazing amount of green space and making sure that the site isn't too clustered because that is um, exactly the opposite of what we wanted to do. Moving forward to the next slide. Furthermore, um, as I've been speaking about, we really um, think that the best part about mixed use 128 is the um, availability of the Charles River. And we wanna fully utilize this to the best of our advantage. Um, the one thing we wanna do, and as you saw on our development map, is we wanna create this 50 to 100 foot setback from the river um, to create this bike path, this walking path for the enjoyment of public use. As we've mentioned before, um, and Hannah has highlighted, um, there's the Upper Falls Greenway that passes by the Northland development site and also the Charles River um, pathways that pass um, by mixed use 128 on the other side of Highland Ave. We think that this is a great opportunity um, for us to connect both of these uh, walking and biking paths in order to create a seamless flow within mixed use 128, create um, foot traffic within our site and furthering this um, weekend environment, so to say, not the typical nine to five workspace, but also creating that environment after work where people are here to enjoy themselves, to enjoy the food that can be served and to enjoy the beverages that um, they, can, they can buy. Um, if you go down to the next slide, here are some inspirations we took for what we wanted to see. Um, as you can tell from the pictures, um, we wanna see as much green as possible. You've heard me say green space a million times in this presentation. Um, we definitely wanna stay away from the black and gray colors of asphalt, the current buildings on the site and um, other sorts of buildings and create this lively um, environment that people want to, to come in. Um, another thing that we would love to see included is this um, opportunity for a bike share program, um, much like the city bikes you would see in Boston. Um, to be able to create that that bike and walking path that um, will seamlessly flow with the Upper Falls Greenway and the Charles River Pathways. Moving on to the next photo. This is a bit of a rendering of um, what you could see on the Charles River side of Mixed Use 128. Um, on the left hand of the photo, that would be the Charles River. There'd be some wonderful uh, green grass on both sides, a pathway for you to walk um, and bike and just overall for the um, enjoyment of the public. Moving uh, to the next slide. One of the uh, ways that we would connect this Upper Falls Greenway and the Charles River Pathways is through um, revitalizing the current trail uh, rail bridge uh, that is on the site. On the back end of Mixed Use 128, there is an out of date, no longer being used uh, sort of uh, train tracks and um, this is going over the, um, the Charles River by, by way of a rail bridge. Of course, this isn't in, in use currently, but what we want to do is we want to revitalize this bridge, um, make it a pedestrian bridge uh, to connect that Upper Falls Greenway um, and enabling people to walk from the Northland, North, Northland development site onto ours. This picture you see right here is actually taking taken at um, Elm Bank Park. Uh, one of our uh, team members, Ryan Horning, actually took this photo, I'm pretty sure. Um, he said how beautiful it was and how much it added to the site. And we think that um, doing this on Mixed Use 128 will just make it so much more lively, um, allowing people to walk from one end of the, uh, of the river to the other. Um, actually, but, but, sorry, could you go back? Another thing I wanted to mention is that um, we recently learned that this isn't a novel idea. Currently, there is another uh, rail bridge being um, considered to become a pedestrian bridge. Um, it's actually on Christina Street, which is within two blocks of our site. And because of this, we think that this is a great case study as to how we should go about um, creating this environment and uh, revitalizing the bridge that is currently in on mixed use 128. Moving forward, I'm gonna pass it on to Grayson 
and he will um, be able to mention a little bit more about the staples slash commercial district that you will see on the next slide. Thank you, Nick. Apologies for the formatting on this one. I think that uh, might have just like, fit weirdly with the screen. But as I mentioned earlier, the Staple District, the whole idea of the center is really it's named for two reasons. Firstly, because Staples is located here. And second of all, because this is really where a lot of these companies that are currently on the site, they're, sta they're staples of the community. And we want to make sure that they have a place where they can stay for the long term. Um, you know, we understand that with relocating people throughout the site, we wanted to give them something that really could be considered an upgrade from their existing space is a way to help entice them to want to move. And so by creating this space, we'll offer newer buildings with more efficient floor plans. Um, so to help, maybe you might have slightly less space, but it's gonna be much more efficient space. It'll be brand new and it's gonna have excellent access and visibility. As you can see, it's right along Highland Ave with the Charles River nearby. This is a really great space for businesses to move to and helps us you know, keep these businesses on site as opposed to force them to find new homes somewhere else. Sort of pivoting here, you know, the less exciting part of the project, but still incredibly important is um, our parking garages and our parking allocation throughout the site. So we understand that nobody really wants to see parking on a site. It's not really attractive and it definitely feels like it can detract, but at the same time, it's crucial for making these things successful. We're really happy with our parking plan for the site. Well, we are gonna have some surface parking throughout the site in front of different buildings and nearby. We have these three major parking areas that help us really concentrate a large portion of these cars into certain spaces. So first we have the B1 garage, as I mentioned earlier, which is completely hidden underground. And it's a really great way to have ample parking while also still hiding it. Next, we have this rear parking structure all the way in the back of the site. This is, a, this is an above ground structure and it is a bit larger, but we think that it's by moving a fact here, it's less visible for people on day to day. And we can also add you know, cool design aspects to the outside of the garage to make it blended better with the community. Finally, we have the B3 surface lot. This is a surface lot for two reasons. One, because a lot of these retail uses and the restaurants nearby, people don't want to park in a garage and then walk. They don't be able to park surface parking and have easy access to where they need to go. And so I think that this lot being here allows all these really stores nearby to be able to benefit, all these restaurants to benefit from easy access to parking, as well as the uh, apartment building nearby. And also these all add up to nearly a thousand spaces, which is a great place to start off for such a large site like this. And I'm going to pass it off to Ryan, who's going to walk everybody through the site branding. Awesome. Thank you, Grayson. So as I mentioned earlier, from our case studies, we learned the importance of rebranding the site to be able to activate it and um, bring in all these new uses. And we wanted to have a very cohesive site. So we found that um, in speaking with Charlie Lodge of the Proverb Agency, a key way to do this would be incorporating the strengths of the site and reminding um, the community members of uh, this being one particular site. So to do this, we came up with the brand of River 128. Um, and we believe that this incorporates the two major components of our site, the proximity to Route 128, and then also the Charles River. Um, and so one way that we thought that we could uh, use this branding to create a cohesive site is through outdoor artwork, um, whether that be at the entrance with a large sign that incorporates aspects of water, all of these uh, artworks throughout the site will have some water component to remind uh, community members of the Charles River, as right now it's currently hidden in the back of the site and uh, might not be as known that it's there. Um, so we could put this artwork close to some of the office buildings that are closer to 128 um, with water as a main component. And then also, uh, as I'll get into in a second, uh, with our medians in the middle of our roadway that weaves through the site, we were also thinking to have some artwork uh, similar to the concept in the seaport with artwork in the median. So next, I will be talking about our recommended traffic and road improvement plan. Um, so as we mentioned earlier, we spoke with um, Monica of the 128 Business Council to come up with a solution and uh, figure out some of our uh, improvements we could make to the site. So here's just a brief scope of our improvements. I'll give everyone a second to read through them. So the first one that we have is we want to upgrade the traffic signals at our site access points. Um, this would be at First Avenue in Highland and Second Avenue in Highland. By upgrading the technology that's in these traffic signals, uh, we could hopefully account for more uh, flow along Highland Avenue. And then we also want to upgrade the site frontage. Um, as you can see right now from that picture on the left, the asphalt sidewalk and some of the shrubs are not as inviting as we'd like it to be. 
So by doing this, we could possibly extend, expand the sidewalk to be six feet wide and maybe move it onto the property line a bit for a better right of way. And then also there's currently a bike lane that doesn't extend all the way along our site, but we are looking at, um, as you can see in the picture in the bottom right, extending it eastbound up the site, as Nick mentioned, we want to uh, be able to have bikes as a way of transportation uh, to mitigate some of the traffic uh, along this site and in the community. And then our last two points here, um, this shuttle service, which I'll get into next, uh, could potentially mitigate the amount of cars that would be coming to these two large office buildings. And then for our road, we want a landscape median um, with one lane in each direction that weaves through the site. So for our recommended plan, when we spoke with Monica, she believed that uh, this shuttle service would be beneficial and that these buildings would be considered corporate retail members, um, which, would, uh, which would cost approximately 55,000 uh, annually for these businesses to operate this service. Um, the life sciences building, we estimated there would be approximately 400 employees and the medical office building around 300. So some of the perks that these employees would have is there's uh, seven different morning departure times per day and same with evening times as well. And this service would operate five days a week, um, Monday to Friday. So then for our funding, when looking at um, how we could fund some of these road improvements, uh, site improvements and infrastructure, we looked to a, diff a couple of different sources. The first being MassWorks. Um, the community one stop for growth is currently up um, and it's a program that helps kind of accelerate the application portal um, for developments that are on a in, within the development continuum. Uh, so we viewed this as a way to receive um, funding for our road work and site improvement uh, on the site. And then next we thought of the option. Uh, this isn't something that we think is nest like extremely necessary, but it's definitely certainly an option for the town of Needham uh, to implement a tax increment financing plan, um, as I'll get into next with uh, the amount of tax revenue that will be generated on this site. Um, so they could issue a bond that is backed by the anticipated tax revenue um, and be able to allocate some of this property for more improvement within Needham, um, which may be necessary. And then um, as we saw with TripAdvisor, this could potentially be spread out over 13 years. And we feel this with the 700 jobs that are coming into this area um, whether it be from existing employees or new jobs, uh, that this real estate tax exemption uh, would be appropriate. And then looking at the cultural facilities fund within mass development, uh, this could help fund our performing arts space that we've alluded to earlier, um, as we feel that it qualifies. And then looking at the Needham Community Preservation Act, uh, which talks about there's funds allocated for acquisition and preservation of space. Uh, we believe with the th approximately 13 acres of green space and open space on our site that's open to the community and uh, we could potentially receive some funding from the preservation act and then lastly for private capital we feel that with this transformative um, community oriented development uh, developers will be incentivized as well as the uh, amount of uh, revenue that they could generate uh, from owning equity or putting equity into some of these buildings so just to recap um, where some of our funds would be allocated toward. For roads, we'd look to MassWorks and potentially a tax increment financing option. For site improvements, we look again to MassWorks and then the Community Preservation Act of Needham. And then for the buildings themselves, we'd look toward uh, private capital. So now just getting into some of the property tax analysis. So given all of these buildings, I'll give everyone um, a minute just to glance over this again we found that the town of Needham would generate approximately $4.4 million uh, in estimated property tax annually. Um, and we found this by calculating using the current tax rate for 2021, uh, which is $25.74 per $1,000 of assessed value. Um, so for our assessed value, we just use the uh, estimated total cost of each building. And then on this next slide here, we have the 10 year DCF which would uh, give us the present value that the town of Needham could back their uh, tax increment financing with if they want that route. Um, and we used a growth rate of 4% as we looked at um, how the tax rate was increasing uh, by approximately 4% uh, when it was increased in the past couple of years. Um, so now I will pass it off to Claire to wrap up and provide our main takeaways. Great, thanks Ryan. 
Um, so just to wrap up the presentation, like Ryan said, I'm going to reiterate some of the main takeaways, um, including uh, the overall risks and opportunities of the site. But first, I want to talk about um, the economic and social benefits of our pro proposal. We realize the importance of considering this aspect given our close work with the town of Needham. So the main economic benefits that I want to emphasize are first the tax benefits to the town that Ryan just touched on. We, uh, in addition to this, we also realize the importance of providing a potential space for existing tenants, given that many of them would be displaced with um, the proposal of our development plan. Moving on to social benefits, um, we believe that the uses we decided on have the potential for various programming events that will bring the community of Needham together in this area. The Charles River will really be central in this um, as members of the community can utilize the public walking and biking trail and also use um, a new bridge. So we believe that there will be um, really massive social benefits to having this walking path connect across Highland Avenue and up to the Northland site as it will be an easy way to bring more community members to the site. Um, we also ensure that this site would be able to address various needs that we heard from the community, such as the need for a performing arts center, um, age-friendly housing, and also various workspaces. So um, I also wanna to touch on the risks that we realized throughout this project, but I also wanna emphasize um, the many opportunities that we saw. So as you can tell from this slide, there are definitely ample risks associated with the project. Um, we would have to tackle the displacement of current tenants. Um, our plan also includes remapping roads within the site. Um, we would have to think about public approval in the town of Needham and any traffic concerns that the public may have. Um, we would also have to go through the permitting, uh, construction, and assembling of the parcels. However, um, we really believe that the opportunities that this site provides far outweighs the risks. As you can tell by our previous analysis, um, there are really high rents that we can command for various buildings on the site due to its accessibility to both Route 128 and the Charles River. We also see an opportunity to create synergies between our site and the close construction of the Northland Newton development up Highland Avenue. Um, and lastly, Needham has very strong demographics which can justify a large array of different uses. So, um, I would like to end the presentation on this slide, which hopefully gives a visual representation of what the opportunities for the site can look like. We believe there are a lot of opportunities for the site, um, and hopefully these were highlighted during our presentation. My group and I learned a lot throughout this project, and we would now like to say thank you to everyone for taking the time to come to our presentation today. Okay. Thank you. That's uh, go ahead, Ed. Yeah, I just want to, if we could go back to uh, gallery view for a moment. Um, outstanding job. So proud of all of you. Great, great work. Uh, so we'd like to just uh, ask um, Adam if he wants to kind of facilitate any Q&A for a bit. Thank you very much. Uh, I certainly would. Um, there's a few things that I'd like to say right out of the gate. First of all, wow. It's very difficult for me to come up with a, a different word to express uh, um, our appreciation and uh, uh, for the hard work that you've done, the creative work, the visioning exercise that you've done to come up with so many different components working together is, uh, is an extraordinary visioning um, uh, outcome. Um, uh, I think you guys have done an, ex an extraordinary job uh, this is a very complicated process. The geography itself is complicated. Um, clearly traffic, uh, you know, is a benefit and a curse. And, uh, and we'll get in momentarily into, um, into some of the specifics, but just very generally, I, I'd like to say thank you very much for, uh, for the work that, uh, that the entire team has undertaken. I think the work product speaks for itself it is an absolutely professional level uh, uh, product. And uh, I think you guys have done an extraordinary job. I will open this up uh, in, uh, in a moment. Just for, for clarity though, uh, for any members of, of the public, this is not a, um, you know, this is not a, a, a town project. 
There is no, uh, there is no development here. Uh, um, uh, uh, this is an extra, this is an academic exercise and uh, the work that the students have done is entirely their own. I will also say though that the work is, is done at such a high level that it's an example I think that we may want to consider as, um, you know, as the town and other private developers contemplate, um, uh, contemplate uh, unlocking uh, the potential from this site. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up, I guess, first to, um, uh, to any members of the Council of Economic Advisors uh, to see if any of the council members have any questions or comments. Um, so if you do, I'd ask you to raise your hand. I, I see David's hand up. David, I'm gonna call on you first. You're still muted. There we go. All right, my, uh, my camera disappeared for a moment. Uh, thank you very much for a really good <laughs> presentation. Um, it, it certainly has given us a lot to think about and um, I hope we will continue to do that for a while. I had one question in particular. Um, there was uh, credit given to the issue of there will be there, this vision would involve displacing existing tenants, existing users. And I really didn't follow, frankly, uh, I saw near the end there, there was a chart that said economic benefits. And it seemed like included in the benefits was there are going to be people displaced. And I know that's not really what you meant, but I wasn't sure how do we, is the, is the implication that that's, that's a, ch a challenge that we need to address, would, would need to address and find some other place for them? Or at times during the presentation, I thought you might be saying we've made space within this vision for relocating those displaced tenants. And I, I just wasn't clear. So I, I'd like to get a little clarification on that. And then the other question that occurs to me is, um, was any consideration given to access points to the property, uh, opening up stuff that isn't there already? And by specifically what I mean is, um, if you look at the aerial site, um, the location of the railway uh, easement going over uh, the, the north side of the property. Um, of course, there was a bridge that went over 128 until not too long ago. And, um, and north of that is another section of land in the town that is industrial and uh, commercial industrial, I believe. And, um, and I'm curious as to whether that there was ever has been any consideration of hope punching through there. Um, if you're going to essentially give up the easement and give up on a vision of, a, of a, another railway bridge across the highway, and maybe that wasn't addressed, but any thought about trying to connect to that traffic area? Thank you for your thoughts and your ideas. I appreciate all your work. So I can start on this one, as far as the displacement goes. So if we did recognize, obviously, that like with our larger plan and the main portion of the site, that displacement was a concern that we had throughout this project because you have so many like important businesses that are already located here. So part of like us trying to mitigate those issues was in the northern end of the site with the staple district. The idea was that like if a couple of the if we could help put these buildings and the, these companies into larger buildings that could accommodate multiple tenants in a more efficient type space, we could help relocate these tenants into a denser area in that northern end of the site while also providing much better visibility from Highland Avenue. It's kind of like a trade-off, like, yes, we understand that we're moving you to a different part of our site. However, in turn, we are offering you much better access, like, from Highland Ave and better visibility as well as kind of a compromise. We do understand that's obviously an issue that's really, really difficult to work with, especially in projects like this. And you have to be really cognizant of those, those types of concerns and issues. Good. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, uh, David, by the way, your hand is still up. So I don't know if you are having, if you have a subsequent question, a follow-up question or. No, I just forgot to turn it, I'll turn it off, thanks. Very good. Uh, Virginia, Lees, uh, Stu, I know for the record, Stu, that you're here, will mark you present on the agenda. Um, Greg, do you have any questions? Oh, actually I saw, so I just saw Stu's hand go up. So I'm gonna go to Stu. Uh, you go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Um, <clears throat> great presentation, really broad, very uh, interesting. I think the question I had was more around um, 
the difficulty we have in that area with regard to so many owners and how do we get that property into one cohesive unit in order to do something here. Uh, do you guys have any thoughts about that? Uh, did you get any experiences from some of the other places you looked at? How uh, one might be able to um, go after that particular problem? Yeah, I can uh, start this one. So um, with the given circumstances of COVID, we wanted to be mindful that some of these um, current owners may not or have adapted their business model slightly. Um, and we didn't really dig into this uh, too much, but we were looking at potentially if people are in a space where maybe they have too much space now or they can do some of their uh, work remotely, we'd be able to buy out their ownership rights and hopefully uh, start to combine the parcels as we go along. And obviously we know this presents the risk of uh, potentially people holding out to try to get better deals, but that is why we also are trying to um, help relocate some of these tenants to still like on the site, but just to a different uh, part of it. Um, and then uh, as for the second part, sorry, I, I forgot the second part of your question. I, I think you're addressing the question. I, I think the, the challenge is maybe a, uh, the second part of the question is, is can, if this was phased in somehow, in some way, mm -hmm. do phase it? Because I think the reality is getting all that property under one owner in order to you know, make a project of this scale is really the, the, the key challenge here, right? I mean, your ideas are really interesting and the, the types of businesses you're recommending make a lot of sense to me at least. Um, but I think the question is, we've always been challenged in that area because there are, you know, the properties are small and the number of owners is so large. So if you were to start this thing on a phased approach, where would you start it? It's a great question. I can try this one to start. Obviously, it's really difficult because you have to see what the parcel would open up first. But I think right. probably the most one of the most logical places to start would be along, like, would be in the back end of the site and then try to, try to isolate the far left side and to work from there across or to maybe start from the right side and work down. Because, you like, with the project like this, if you have to be going all the way through a really large site, like, this is going to be really difficult. You want to pick like one really strong portion and then work throughout the site from there. So I'd want to pick one side specifically, whether that was starting on the left or starting on the right, and then eventually work in the opposite direction from there. If you start in the middle and try to work out, it's going to be a mess. And then I'll just, I'll just add something about the assemblage. It's an enormous complication of this project. The closest example, uh, and it didn't work out well for the original assembler, which was a university station in Westwood. That used to be a collection of 50 or more small industrial buildings leading away from Route 128 all the way sat, uh, sat east. And uh, a developer called Cabot, Cabot and Forbes bought all of those buildings. And it was a financial disaster. Uh, it was around the time of the global financial crisis. And, um, Basically, the, the project went bankrupt, it nearly bankrupted a bank called Anglo-Irish Bank, and uh, a developer called New England Development bought it at a very low price and built what you see now, and it's very successful. This was one of the hugest complications of this project, is the assemblage. And just going back to the phasing, I think, um, at least from my perspective, uh, starting in the northeast corner of the site, um, right next to the Charles River and uh, Highland Avenue. I think that would be the first area that we try to assemble parcels and be able to create that space for these businesses that um, we would eventually be displacing to hopefully uh, have that space ready and available before we uh, start any of our other construction. Lise. Was there any thought of taking the kind of theme of the exist existing businesses? You know, there's this, you know, I kind of go down there, it's got the Olympia stone, it's kind of got a maker creator type of vibe in order to kind of entice the tenants and the owners to be vested in your interest. Was there any thought of ever using the existing type of businesses to build out on? Did I stump you, student? <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I can, I can take a, a quick stab at this. So 
Um, we did look into a lot of the existing uh, types of businesses, and that's kind of the um, vibe and aesthetic that we're looking for in the commercial district um, or the Staples district. So we're looking to have a site kind of span in a broad spectrum of uses and in each different area of the site have sort of a little bit of a different feel while being one cohesive site. Um, so in the Staples district, that's a lot of what we're looking for. And then uh, a lot of the other uses that we're proposing in the other areas of the site were highly recommended from other developers and um, brokers. So we kind of tried to find a way to pair both of those together um, while most effectively using the site. Yeah, I think one of the things we all realized early on, we went there, I mean, I live near there, I've been to this place before, but I took the students there in January, late January. A lot of the buildings are very dysfunctional. They're very old, they don't lay out well, the road pattern is not good at all. So yeah, there are some buildings that are a little more contemporary and a little more functional, but many are very dysfunctional. And uh, what the students at my urging were trying to do is listen to all the feedback from all the interviews across a, a broad range of stakeholders and then figure out what, what can create the best mix of activating the space. But the biggest element was the Charles River. That makes a lot of sense. Greg, I saw that you had your hand up. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, first of all, um, Professor Chazen, I knew that when, whenever we've worked together on a project, I've seen your projects that your, your folks will deliver and they really did this time. So congratulations to them and all of you. Um, we love bold ideas and, and imagination and you brought both of those in here. Um, I also, you'll recall, I challenge you to come up with a name for this place because it's always better to have some vision to help drive it and you do that. And I commend you for that um, and for everything. Just I, my one observation, really more of an observation is that, you know, it felt like I'm one, and for, oh, I also want to say that I really do appreciate that you were sensitive to the existing businesses there, as others have pointed out. I think it's just so really important. There's a legacy of family owned generations um, of businesses there, and we do need to think about them no matter what we ultimately do with this, this area. Um, I also think that that idea of how we connect to, um, to the adjoining area makes a lot of sense. So to, uh, um, we need to think about that. But, but it felt a little bit like maybe you were trying to do too much in one place and particularly you with life sciences and you talked about the young professionals and the, the brewery and the theater and all those things. And then there's senior housing. Uh, and not that seniors don't like beer because we do, uh, <laughs> but um, it, I wonder why we would not try to really create a destination that really is trying to draw those young workers to the area by providing more housing for uh, workforce, not just for the companies that might be located here, but located across the way in TripAdvisor, Shark Ninja, or whatever. Um, and while we very much need senior housing in the area, I think what we really need is all age housing. So housing that's, that's senior friendly, but also young people friendly. And I'm just wondering why distinguish and segregate one building strictly for seniors. I can actually, I can start with this one. Claire, do you want to come in after possibly? Yeah. Claire did a lot of work on the senior housing. Why don't we ask Claire to uh, tackle this one? Okay, yeah, I, I can start, but then Grayson, feel free to add anything. So um, I completely agree with you, Greg. Like there's definitely a lot of uh, need and demand for also the worker aged housing. However, senior housing was something that we heard over and over again that like the demographics would be great for. And also um, we felt it would be great to have housing right up against the river. And with the addition of the new walking path, we just felt it was a great use for right there. Um, and then in terms of tackling like the age friendly housing, we really tried to do that with um, our mixed resident apartment building. So um, after you suggested that we like Thought, think about this need for age-friendly housing. We spoke to community stakeholders who explained how that was also important. So because of that, like we are planning to have a certain percentage of um, apartments within that building be age-friendly. And then, I mean, uh, worker-aged residents can live there as well. Um, so really like we, even though there is demand for also that work um, worker age housing. We just felt the demographics were so strong and also for the future demographics, the way that they're going, it was important to also think about the senior population. But Grayson, go ahead and add anything. 
Yeah, just add another smaller thing too, which is you know, about providing a senior housing on this site here. It allows people to downsize in their homes and then it allows younger families to then move into the homes they're moving out of. And so it helps keep the community young by bringing these newer families without us just building tons of units that are gonna to lead to increased school growth. So like it's, it's a nice way for us to allow people to downsize to a manageable home in turn that creates space for people to move into these single family homes that are out in need of and help maintain a really strong, healthy community. Yeah the, yeah, the other thing that's true about senior housing is that they don't want to be, the residents don't want to be isolated in the woods. And one of the wonderful things, I think what the group came up with was a mix of uses. So if you're 80 years old and you're living in an in assisted living apartment, you can walk out the door and you could go and, yeah, you can have a beer, you can sit along the Charles River, uh, you can have a meal, and you can also go to the, the Performing Arts Center to uh, hear a lecture or watch a performing arts uh, event. So we, you know, one of the things over and over again that the developers of senior housing say is that their residents don't want to be isolated and segregated in the woods. So one last thing to add here as well is the senior housing wouldn't have as much of a traffic burden on Highland Ave as some uh, regular uh, multifamily housing would because of less drivers in the building. So just one more consideration we took it there. It certainly it certainly speaks to uh, a, you know a broader complexity of traffic and a mix of uses. Uh, Greg does make a very interesting point because there is you know you have businesses there, you have offices there that would attract a whole range of uh, um, economic type positions from people that you know that are entry level positions to executives to people that you know, uh, service the restaurants, clean the buildings. There's a whole broad range. There is, there is demand for workforce housing uh, across the region. It's a, it's a great uh, challenge that the region faces. Um, and there are different, and the different types of uses that you have, for instance, between um, uh, yeah, um, life sciences, like a lab, their traffic requirements are very different. Uh, they have different day parts of activity as opposed to, for instance, retail that would have different day parts activity for traffic. So it all affects uh, the traffic picture in a very complicated way. I do, I do like the concept though, that you are trying to mix multiple uses and you're, and you're trying to liven up what otherwise, if, if this was like, I think Professor Jason was saying, a senior, I mean, this could be just in itself an extraordinary senior living geography. It would be, you know, and it could also be an extraordinary workforce housing with some retail right along, um, you know, in behind uh, where the river is with, you know, with uh, apartments, you know, along uh, the river. Uh, but you kind of miss the social interaction of the two demographics. So ultimately, perhaps maybe the market decides there are other market forces. I do, I do want to step out for a second and commend you on the use of open space. Again, it really was a highly creative uh, um, use and imagination. And I think it brings in um, a ton of local engagement. Clearly, because Northlands development would be right across the river, there would be a you know a flood of foot traffic from from Newtonites, um, and and yet uh, you know we'd love to see the amenities to be useful across for all of Needham as well. And I think the idea of having some kind of a performing arts center with a big setback off the river is so inviting for all residents. It's such a lively aspect. I think it's really, again, a very smart um, uh, and exciting uh, 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 presentation. There were a couple of logistical questions that I see that have come up as well. Um, uh, one person asked uh, if, if you guys know who owns, for instance, the majority of the properties there. Have you done a, an identification of how many properties are on the site currently and how many are owned by perhaps a single user or a single owner? Hmm. 
Yeah, so we did some checking just through the uh, town GIS database by just looking at different users. We saw there's a lot of different LLCs as far as ownership went, but we couldn't really, we didn't dive much deeper to look at like, individual owners, but just saw that it was clearly a lot of individual property owners that have, had, that have held these for a pretty significant amount of time. Yeah, I mean, one of the, just to address that really very relevant question, because it goes to the complexity of the assemblage, each property will typically be owned in its own LLC. There may be common economic interest among many properties, but you'd never know that from the way it's listed in town records because it's listed under the name of a limited liability company. That's right. Real estate brokers know who owns it. They do. And uh, that, that's where the assemblage is, is art as much as science. One of uh, another question that, that's uh, come up. Um, one of the points that you talk about is remapping the roadway, the uh, network of roads throughout the site. Have you given thought to various to any specific roads, uh, um, Highland Circle in particular, as an example? So I can start with this one. Um, we did look at the existing road network and we were actually in conversations with uh, VHB, but unfortunately our trip generation data and some of the other um, points about the road network uh, still have yet to come to us and which is why we haven't, or we were not able to incorporate them in our conversation. Um, so Amy, we will pass that along as soon as we receive it. Um, but that was essentially the information we were waiting on to consider our um, road network and how we would uh, restructure it. So apologies for not having that uh, for this presentation. It's totally understandable. Uh, um, I, uh, I want to just ask to see if anyone else on the CA has any other questions. I don't see any. I now actually want to turn this over back to the students and ask you or Professor Chasen if any of you have any other questions. Anybody? have some questions of the town, what they want to do now. <laughs> Hannah, what would you ask the town? You're, you, you opened up the presentation so nicely. Why don't we ask you to start this, this dialogue? Um, yeah, I would, I guess I'd like to hear from some of you about um, your favorite aspects about the project or what you're most excited about. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, I can see if any of the other council members take their uh, mm -hmm. themselves off mute to answer. I, while other people are doing that, I can the, the brewery, the whole concept of unlocking, um, unlocking the river, and the landscape and the use of open space, mm -hmm. it really is it really is magical, and I think the concept of having these really small retail boutiques and a multi-type, multi-use approach to um, uh, uh, to food, I think is really creative. I, I, I love that, um, but I want to open this up. David, Liz, Greg, um, David, you have your hand up, so I'm going to go to David. Um, yeah, I guess I, the thing that jumps out at me is the um, potential for working across the river um, with another town, uh, uh, city, and tapping into the, um, the benefits that are hopefully going to develop on that side. And so that we uh, would be taking a sort of mini regional approach to the, to the um, both from an amenity perspective, but also for, from the perspective of, of developing the infrastructure necessary to make it happen. So um, that, that brings its own challenges, but I think ultimately it carries a, a bigger reward. Anyone else? Adam, my, my uh, computer is not working uh, visually, so I, you're not able to see my hand raised. No, but, but I, uh, I <laughs> Anyway, I, I want to congratulate this group of students uh, again on the, the, the concepts that they discussed. It basically checked every box that we as the uh, uh, Council of Economic Advisors have talked about over years regarding the traffic, the need for housing, uh, uh, additional employment, tax revenue, all of that. So they they basically did a just a, a bang up job 
in checking every box of every concern that we had. Right before Stu asked the question, I was about to ask the same question. Uh, and I, I think everyone can generally agree that because of the small parcels and diverse ownership, uh, it would require unprecedented cooperation among all the various owners to be able to assemble this. And I can't see it happening, but under one developer to be able to get that done. Mm -hmm. And I guess one of the questions that I would have is um, as unpopular a notion as this might be, if there is some way that uh, the town could force the issue uh, from an eminent domain standpoint uh, for the betterment of the town. One of the biggest problems you have is that you have a lot of small owners over there uh, that, for example, uh, car repair, you can't replace that. You can't move them as an owner or as a tenant to some other space within Needham, at least not easily. And that is where it is those types of businesses where you're going to find the most resistance to something like this. So anyway, I know I throw it out, threw out a couple of concepts here, but uh, um, it would be very, very difficult for uh, one person to be able to assemble this. Uh, I guess one, one additional uh, point on the, uh, uh, for, the, uh, for the group is considering these concerns um, and how, how it would affect the economics of being able to accomplish it. Uh, you get to the point where you have to assemble this stuff. And if you start to do it piecemeal, each uh, owner that's left realizes the value of his property. And it gets to the point where, you know, the economics have to work. It's nice that you could put in a life science building or senior housing. But if if the cost of entry is so high that it doesn't make uh, those projects feasible, you, you've you lost everything. That's absolutely true. Uh, there's a, a story about that in Waltham. Um, there used to be a department store on Moody Street, you may, some of you may remember, called Grover Cronin. And a developer bought the department store out of bankruptcy with a plan to basically use the facade and then build an apart, a luxury apartment building above it along the Charles River. And he bought the whole building for very little money out of bankruptcy. But to really create the development plan he wanted, he needed to buy a little parcel of land in the back along the Charles River. And all that was on it was a, a bar, you know, like an old style tavern. But the owner of the bar knew that he, the developer needed that little parcel to really create the feasible development plan. So apparently he sold the land, the parking lot and the bar to the developer for three times the price the developer paid for the larger parcel in front, which was the department store. And that illustrates what you've been talking about. Harvard University faced that when they were buying up hundreds of parcels in North Alston to create the expansion that you see occurring now. It's a huge, con uh, a huge complexity. And unfortunately, I don't think any of us have an answer for it. <laughs> Any other? Oh, go okay. ahead, Virginia. Um, I also want to congratulate everybody. That very well done, very well thought through, and uh, uh, I was really excited about the open space and also the theater because I think when you think about a theater, you immediately think, "Oh, who's going to pay it? Who's going to fund it? How are we going to support it?" But you guys went ahead and put that in there in your vision, and something like that might be like the rallying point. For this type area that then it does could make everybody want it to be more cohesive so thank you for putting that in uh, at this point uh i'll go back uh to see again if anyone has any other questions um while anyone's thinking of any i would say that uh we will uh load this presentation up on our site um uh, needhamma.gov uh, Amy, if we're able to uh, post it up on the Council of Economic uh, Advisors site, uh, the presentation itself, that would also be, uh, be great. I know it'll live elsewhere at needhamma.gov. Um, but beyond that, is there any other question that anybody else has, or does anyone else want to make a comment? I will say that uh, seeing some other comments from the public, that they're all very grateful for your creativity and imagination 
and uh, and I think appreciate like we all do the challenges of finding a mix of uses that are complementary, both to the space and to each other, that would have offsetting benefits to the community as a whole, like Virginia was talking about with the open space, uh, the performing art space, uh, and so on. Um, anyone else have any other comments or questions? Adam, I'd just love to jump in and, and also congratulate the students for an amazing presentation. Uh, you peeled back so many layers of the onion and were so thorough in your interview and in research techniques. And um, I have to, you know, I'm speaking for myself, but I'm, I'm sure many would agree with me that um, you far exceeded our expectations as to what you would deliver. And I'm very grateful for, you know, this great information that we will use um, as, you know, a, a springboard to have lots of conversations and to, uh, you know, engage the public um, in a robust process as we start to envision, uh, you know, future opportunities. So thank you all very, very much. Yeah, I, I just want to close again the way we started, which is to thank the town for giving the students this incredible opportunity to uh, engage in all the complexity of a big real estate development project, get out and interview people. Uh, we very much appreciate Amy and Greg facilitating this, making introductions so they could interview people um, and just generally being supportive and then, you know, sponsoring today's very broad-based audience to hear the students' ideas. So I just want to close by thanking you again for the opportunity you gave the students and to support uh, what we're doing here at Boston College. And again, uh, the more comments that we're receiving uh, is excellent visioning work. And uh, they, you know, people really do appreciate the hard work that you guys uh, have undertaken over the course of the last uh, several months. Thank you very much. Uh, we look forward to seeing your success. Uh, and uh, we're grateful for the opportunity uh, that the chamber was able to, uh, to make here in connecting us with Professor Chazen. Jason, it's been a delight to work with uh, you and, and your entire team and the students who run a very professional shop. They should all be commended. You should all be commended on your high caliber of research and presentation skills and critical thinking. And uh, I think you guys really did a phenomenal job. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much. Adam, I think we should end with um, enjoy your graduation and congratulations on making it through a really unusual senior year. So Thank you, Lise. That's right. Enjoy you. your day. You earned it. Okay. Thanks, all. All right. Thank see you, soon, everyone. Bye-bye. Now, uh, for the Council of Economic Advisors that are left, may I please have a motion to adjourn? Oh. Motion to adjourn. Second. Okay. Second. Any discussion? Hearing none, uh, I'll call the roll. Uh, Stu. Uh, yes, agree. Rick. Yes. Virginia. Yes. Please. Yes. David. Yes. And the chair is I. We are adjourned again. We're grateful and thank you very much. Excellent job. Thank you. Excellent job. Students, I'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.